Welcome back and thank you for staying with News Center. We continue with the broadcast. Now I want to shift focus to Mata's poll preparedness, focusing on the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission and some of the challenges it is facing in order to give Kenyans a free, fair and credible elections. Having this conversation in the backdrop of the IEBC acting CEO just meeting members of the JLA committee just this week and mentioning that perhaps IEBC needs more money in terms of additional funds in order to do stuff like the voters verification and not just that, also settle some of their pending bills when it comes to the legal fee and what not. So we'll generally take a look at the state of preparedness when it comes to some of the legal issues that have arisen so much clamor around the IBC elections law that's currently on the floor of the House. We'll int uh, interestingly take a look as well at some of the issues around the compliance of the timelines. It's also proper to note that IBC, as of yet, has not yet gotten an auditor to go through the voters' register. And according to the timelines, this should have happened by the 9th of February 2022, and that's yesterday. So we're trying to beat timelines, but according to the IBC, they seem confident they'll still meet those timelines. Let's have a conversation with Mule Musa, who's just joining me in studio right now. He's the national coordinator of ELOG. That's the Election Observation Group. It's great to have you with us. And Karibu Sana. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps you can start with some of the intrigues that played out as the IBC acting CEO met with the JLA Committee of Parliament. And he interestingly put it that perhaps they're cash strapped. They need a supplementary budget in order to meet some of their costs when it comes to the legal fee, the administrative costs, and equally in order to conduct the voter verification. These are quite important processes. What's your reaction to that as we begin? Well, first, thank you for having me um, for this particular interview. Uh, perhaps we begin from the point where IBC did give uh, a budget um, uh, of 40.9 billion uh, shillings to uh, the S for the for, for, to Parliament for purposes of course of uh, being funded for these elections. Uh, we know that in the first tranche, uh, IBC got around 26 billion, uh, and they decried the fact that they never had the difference, which was around 14 million. Uh, and subsequently, some extra money, especially when they were conducting the second. Uh, voter uh, registration process, the first voter registration process, mm -hmm. some extra amount of money was advanced to them, uh, which was part of that budget. And uh, we have seen that in the supplementary budget, there's an allocation of 8.1 billion, if I'm not wrong, um, that is supposed to go to uh, IEBC. If we were to look at those amounts, uh, my, I've not done the exact math, but yeah. we should be coming to the amount that uh, IABC uh, did request for, which would be 40.9 billion. So I think the question here would be, uh, is IABC adding or asking for more money beyond what they had requested for, which is the 40.9 billion, and what would it be for? And I think you've alluded to some of the issues that they are thinking about. Mm -hmm. I think the voter inspection, since it's part of the, the process that um, are supposed to be undertaken, should be part of their original budget. I don't see anything we should change as far as that is concerned. Perhaps the more uh, interesting aspect would be the question of their previous debts uh, or whatever uh, payments they need to make uh, for the previous period uh, that are recurring at the moment and uh, litigation, because you see litigation, you can only make a provision for it. You do not know uh, how much of this you're going to have to engage. And, this, and since this is a country where litigation um, is something which is nearly a norm, especially when it comes to election issues, then there could be a small point there in terms of perhaps it has gone beyond the provision they had provided. But still, uh, it is within the remit of uh, IEBC to be able to make, uh, and I think we have discussed these things very many times before, that they need to make um, uh, provisions based on the contextual environment that they are operating in. We have told them that they need to anticipate litigation nearly in every process. Of course, one way, one way of trying to avoid that is ensuring that all the processes are done in a very transparent way, yeah. in a manner that does not raise any, any, any issues that um, make somebody to, to, to run to court. So I think for me, uh, my initial uh, reaction is that maybe they need to clarify to us 
uh, whether we are talking about a budget beyond the 40.9 and then in what respects and why were these respects not anticipated before. Even as we talk about that budget, I mean Kenya's electoral process has been on the spot in terms of being one of the most expensive elections to run. Well, what's your regard to IBC's appetite and also on the flip side, the accountability aspect? Because 40.9, and we had a couple of politicians try to fight this off even earlier on when there was still BBI clamor, how much it would be needed to conduct a referendum right here in the country. IBC's appetite, is, it, is there any reason to you know, raise a red flag, would you say? The big red flag mm -hmm. that we should raise is uh, a question of fairness uh, in terms of the cost of elections. Okay. Uh, the international standards um, are that we should be using around $5 per voter. In this country, in the last election, we used more than $2,500, uh, which is basically 20, over $25, $26 uh, per voter way above, one of the most expensive, in fact, I think, according to our statistics, I think the second most expensive election in the world. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at that and you're looking to bring this down, um, and, which, and there have been a lot of focus on that issue of costing, uh, why are we having very expensive elections in this country? Um, initially, if you look at the projections of IEBC, when they gave out a budget of 40.9 billion, uh, and looking at their targeted voters uh, who are expected to be around 25, of course they are falling short of that, yeah. 25 uh, million voters, mm -hmm. the budget uh, would still be, uh, per voter, the cost would still have been around 16 shillings, $16, which is 1,600 uh, thereabouts of per voter, which is still very high yeah, by itself. Mm -hmm. The fact that they have even fallen short, if you were to calculate that cost per voter and with the 22 million uh, voters who have, we have at the moment, that uh, cost goes higher to close to 20 again dollars per, uh, per voter. So any increased costs is unwelcome in an election which has already become very expensive. Okay. So that's a big red flag. Um, uh, in terms of um, one of the issues that I think IBC has been using to, um, to justify the costs has been the element of trust. Okay. That um, since Kenyans don't trust the processes, then we have had to bring in a number of other uh, cost drivers. Mm -hmm. Technology itself is a cost driver. And it was brought about because we could not be, uh, trust the manual processes. Uh, and remember the, the debate which has been there over the last one or so weeks uh, when it comes to the elections bills, uh, where people feel that IBC is dragging them backwards when they bring an element of manual voters mm -hmm. or manual voting or manual uh, tabulation of results, transmission yeah. of results. Yeah. So again, um, so, so that element, election technology, the question, that, the question of uh, trying to come with a very uh, safe ballot paper, okay. uh, which has security features and all, mm -hmm. those elements can bring a little bit of a justification to any added cost and the litigation, but that does not discount the fact that we are running a very expensive election and that the drive or we should be thinking about much more of how to reduce costs, not how to increase them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if we have up to seven or is it nine security features in yeah. the ballot paper, that's definitely uh, pointing to deficit of trust. But away from that, let, let's talk about something that has featured prominently. And as of the last time we checked, uh, Mule, IEBC is yet to recruit an auditor with six months to go to the general election. And IEBC is required to secure a reputable auditor uh, that's at least by the 9th of February, and the auditor will go through the voters' register. According to them, the advert was done, and the, there was non-responsive bidders. So in terms of timelines, are we in the red zone, if I may ask, because we still need to weed out the dead voters in the register or weed out double registration in the voters' register, and it seems we're time bad right now. What are the implications, if any? One, yes, we are in the red zone. Uh, the, the timelines given by the Constitution is that six months to an election, they have ended. So um, if IABC does not have an auditor, if they were to procure an auditor right now, I think there would be a problem. Uh, and somebody will run to court. I, I, we talked about litigation. Yeah. Somebody will run to court and say they are doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, so that's, that's already a problem. The question about 
a procurement uh, which was uh, which was done and there were no bidders who came through i don't know what to think about it from a citizen point of view because mm -hmm. i'm thinking this is a country where uh, how many people are rushing for tenders in this country <laughs> i mean it's a tenderpreneur country mm -hmm. where everybody is interested in to making an extra buck we have very many auditors in this country. How these auditors would not find it interesting to audit uh, IEBC unless there were conditions which uh, stopped them from participating. And, and other international uh, organizations, we had KPMG uh, doing the audit the last time. Yeah. I don't know what would be, uh, uh, the, where, why they would find a disincentive uh, in auditing the process once, once more. I don't know. So I think those are, there are questions as far as that aspect is concerned. Okay. Uh, we talked about trust in the previous uh, session when you were asking questions about uh, the cost. Yeah. This is another trust issue because if we want to go to the, register, to, to the elections with a very clean register. You've talked about dead voters, there, there will be errors, there will be so many things that we need to uh, weed out of our voter register. And the public need to be assured that they are having, that whatever we are having now uh, is a clean register. Okay. ELOG on our part, we did an audit of the last voter register after the elections, and this is important, after the elections. Mm. We found many of the errors uh, that had been found by KPMG in the initial audit uh, were still there. They had not been weeded out. Now, if you think, that's the register we're having right, right now. It's still, yeah. You mm -hmm. want at least some of those things and some assurance to the public that this has been attended to. If you walk into that August 9th elections with a voter register where it's whose integrity is in question, especially from a public point of view, okay. then that uh, creates, uh, uh, lowers the confidence of the people who will be participating in that elections. Well, since we seem to be linking each and every question to trust, let, let's still talk about trust, but using the IBC elections bill as a front right now. The, according to IBC, there's been so much misinformation on the media, so let's look at the facts. And according to IBC, they say this bill proposes a complementary mechanism for result transmission to address instances where the transmission of results is not possible owing to the lack of 3G or is it 4G network. And according to them, the bill seeks to align with the case law with which the court decreed that results are a combination of what is contained within the election declaration for, I think, that is Form 34A. Yes. So when it comes to this particular election bill, as ELOG, where do you sit in the divide? Is it taking us three steps forward, five steps backward, or we need this in order to sort of weed out some of the litigation challenges we witnessed at the Supreme Court in 2017. Your take? I think we have no problem with a complementary system. And, yeah. and I keep, I, we have to remind Kenyans that um, uh, our elections are basically a manual election, uh, principally. We cast a physical ballot, we have a physical ballot box, we count physical votes, and it is, the question has not been the manual process of elections. Mm -hmm. It has been how then you transmit those results that you get from the polling stations to the National Tallying Center. That's where been the biggest problem has been. And that's where the use of technology has come in. So having a complementary uh, system which is backed up by a manual process has no problem. However, the contentious points are two. Number one is... Uh, the question of having um, uh, the, the part of the case law points to the fact that uh, the polling station results are final. So mm. if you want a complementary system, it's a complementary system of, that ensures that those polling results are the final ones. Not uh, another step where we're saying, you know, we want to go to the constituencies and also collect and also, also send as part of the, the, the collect, collection of results. That should not be the case. We should be dealing with only the polling stations. Once the presiding officers sent their results to the National Tallying Center, that is final. The other second problem is where we seem to uh, suggest, and these are the clarifications which need to be made by Parliament as they debate those, uh, that laws, is whether we have to wait until the last physical uh, resort is taken to the, tallying, the National Tallying Center for us to be able to pronounce on the results. That is a problem, and because we know that some areas may drag, uh, there's a lot of apprehension about the election results uh, when we, after we conduct our elections. So you want a much more efficient process. Mm -hmm. So they need them to clarify, are we talking about a complementary process which slows everything down, 
when we, 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 the idea of bringing it and uh, the idea of even Kenyans investing on technology was basically to create some speed, yeah, some true. efficiency in mm -hmm. the process. Mm -hmm. So what then would be the essence of technology if it does not serve that purpose of uh, speed and efficiency? So I think if they, in the debate in parliament, because the bill has already been tabled, yeah. I think those are some of the issues that they want to look at and clean out. But in essence, having a complementary system, I think it's, it's already there by default because we do vote manually. And if there was a case even in court to, dis, to um, discredit any results, the option of always going for a recount or going back to that polling stations and finding out where the results are has always been there. So I think ABC was just trying to clean a system where I say there is backup for us yeah. uh, in case something fails or in case something happens. And still back to trust. I mean, guys were poking holes into why the law took so long. These are some of the inconsistencies that were pointed out in the litigation process at the Supreme Court back in 2017. Fast forward to 2022, barely six months, and that's when we've seen this particular bill resurface or surface. I know the lawmaking process is quite lengthy and it's consultations between various stakeholders before it's actually tabled to parliament, but do you read any deficit when it comes to trust issues in terms of the timing? The timing is totally wrong. Um, it's a it's the first big problem with a, a new bill coming at this time. Okay. Uh, in the recommendations given by Justice Krigler uh, following the 2007 uh, elections, uh, the issue of changing laws very late in the day was brought out. And the best practice in the world is that you have a close out, a close a close a session. You have, you have a, an end date to election related. Uh, li li not litigation, but uh, legislation. So that after that date, nobody stops parliament. Uh, if, if, for instance, we say that uh, one year to the elections, we're not going to change any laws mm -hmm. uh, around the elections. Uh, but that does not stop parliament from uh, changing laws for the better, so long as those laws are not effected for the coming election. One year into the election, yeah. you can change your laws, mm -hmm. but don't use them in the coming election. It's the same thing as changing uh, you know, the rules of a football match at night, and then the guys, when they come in the morning, they find that the goalposts have changed. You, you don't do that, because people need to tell that The reason why we have voter education is that you want to educate and sensitize everybody on the rules of the game, on the engagement itself. So when such changing these things, there's already a lot of confusion about this bill. I mean, and you can hear politicians speaking from uh, different parts of the mouth yeah, yeah. about the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you don't want that kind of confusion very late in the day. So in that, in that respect, the law was totally wrong. In terms of, uh, I mean, the, the, the timing was very wrong. Okay. In terms of uh, whether it came late, uh, briefly, uh -huh. just, just the quick, uh, the, the quick part, the point is that this is a political process. Parliament, I don't think Parliament was given uh, that bill by IBC just this year. I think they must have had it a long time. Mm. And based on their own political interests, they decided to bring it very late in the day. The, the focus should be on Parliament in terms of the timing, not on IBC. Well, that's interesting. So we shouldn't change the rules of the game while the game is midway. Yeah? Yes. Okay, interesting. Thanks for your time. Mule Musao right there, the National Coordinator of the Elections Observation Group, better known as ELOG, just highlighting some of the issues around the election preparedness. Barely six months or so to the general election date and the clamor around some of the meeting the timelines, funding this particular election and whatnot is definitely taking a shot up focus we'll continue highlighting some of these issues my name is jesse rogers thank you so much for watching news center keep it ktn news up next updates in the swahili language thank you